have an opportunity to deal with them. As far as this class is concerned, I know where we're where we're going to be tonight will be we'll be talking about the differentiating between the local church and the universal church. And this has been really good for me. Uh, I got to tell you, it's really uh, uh, enlightened might be a too strong of a word, but it's really uh, uh, helped me get a better grasp of when the when the word kingdom comes up in uh, scripture. I just feel like I feel so much better about it. So uh, that's where we're going to be tonight, talking about the universal church and the local church, and uh, and then where I, I want to end. And unless you have an idea, or maybe we need to go expand and, and reach out a little further. Um, I want to talk about the premillennial uh, ideas that are out there that uh, have not just been in the secular world that that uh, the churches of Christ hold some some of these views uh, uh, about the, the millennium and so forth. So I thought we would kind of wind it up there because of uh, it does affect how we use and how we reference the word kingdom. So I thought that was relevant and it'd be good timing to do a, a little study, a short study on premillennialism. That's kind of where my head has been recently. Um, and then uh, I want to get off into another term, a word, and I've shared with you this last time I spoke was I want to talk about uh, the gospel. So um, over the next few weeks, after we, we'll probably wind the kingdom up next week, and then after that, we'll spend a few weeks talking about the gospel. And uh, that's the studies that I'm, I'm interested in that I think will help me personally, and hopefully it's helpful to someone else as well. Um, one other thing, just introductory, that I uh, want to share a conversation I had with uh, Danny Williams last, uh, two weeks ago, I guess, and... Um, uh, we were talking about the church, we are talking about the universal church, and, and uh, somehow the subject came up about um, an experience that we've all, most of us have had, I, I, and I venture to say in this audience, every one of us, is, I'm sure, has had, where you go to a foreign place and you go to church with people you don't know and you feel incredibly welcomed by them. Have you experienced the warmth of, of a congregation of people and you don't know any of them. And they treat you like you're unbelievably important to them. You go to a place, and there's countless stories. One that I can remember when I was a young, a young man and uh, went with Bobby and Dorothy. We were on one of those Arkansas trips we often went on. I think we ended up in Missouri. And we, we scouted out a congregation. We were going to go, all right, we can go worship over here with these folks. And, Next, and there's a sign out front what time to be there. So we show up at 1030 or whatever. And it was a normal size facility, uh, probably similar to our, the building of our church that we, we worship at here. And we get in there, and it was a man, a woman, and his daughter. There were three people. We brought more in the door than they had at the whole worship service. Now, you would have thought we were celebrities because they were glad to have somebody else with them. And... They invited us for supper, and there was just part of us being up there in the Mozart Mountains that I just, we had this vision of this woman wringing a, church, a chicken's neck and, you know, feathering it and the whole bit, and, and uh, but they were so incredibly inviting and welcome, and uh, I know you've experienced it before. One other uh, similar story, uh, Clinton and Inua, they get married on Saturday. Their uh, honeymoon's in San Antonio. And I, uh, I helped them find a church. I said, all right, here's the address of the church. So Sunday morning, they, they go to church in San Antonio. And uh, it was a, an all-black congregation. Everybody there uh, was a, a bunch of black Christians. And, and they were, they treated them like celebrities. But there was a little bit of a glitch. Uh, Nina was dressed that she wore. Something happened. was torn all the way in the back. So she had to just walk like this and... She explained herself, and, and you know, and the people just treated them so well. And Clinton, them, they had such a memorable experience. And you can ask them about their honeymoon in San Antonio. 
And I tell these stories because of their, you, I'm sure I could listen to some of your stories where you go to a place you don't know, and the Christians there, you have such a strong, powerful connection. And to me, that's kind of an experience of the universal church that we get to experience as individuals. Um, and I thought that would be a appropriate introduction to kind of uh, the dire general direction we're going, that we do have experiences with the universal church from time to time, especially in our travels and especially with some of our things that I think we see, we see that there are Christians and it's so encouraging that there's Christians outside of Judson Road or outside of the sphere in which the people we actually know, that there's a lot of Christians out there and you get to experience some of them from time to time and it's really, really encouraging. And I thought that that's where I wanted to, to lead off with this. Well, if you would, bow with me in prayer, and let's, let's really get into the study of the kingdom. Most Holy Father, we're blessed. We're so thankful for this day, for the blessings of it. We're thankful for your son, the great sacrifice he made for us. We're thankful for your word and your truth. We ask that you would help us to be good students and good stewards of it. We ask that you would forgive us of our sins and of our shortcomings. Help us to uh, not be neglectful of the things that we, we leave undone. Um, help us to serve and encourage each other. Forgive us of our sins. Be with us throughout this study and throughout our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you remember, I bragged, I had to brag because I, I made this chart. It took me like 30 minutes to do. And uh, after services, when I talked about this, I had a young lady uh, and she came and talked to me. She said, I don't, don't know about that. And we got to chat just a little bit, and then I got busy. I didn't get to finish really our conversation. But it made me think, I don't know that I drew this well. And, I, and I, so I went back, and I drew it again. This is a better picture. This is a better picture of the kingdom compared to what I had. You know, uh, there's the secular kingdoms we talked about, the, those kingdoms of this world and the leaders and so forth. And then there's the church, the church universal. But within the church universal is Judson Road, or is wherever. And then there's a good drawing of me, or you, or whoever. You know, we put ourselves in, in, that, in that sphere as well. I thought that was really a much better drawing. And um, one of the things that I want to get into tonight, at least a little bit, touch on, is the independence of these churches, that there's not a the church universal doesn't have an executor meeting in some big building that's telling us what we all need to do. So we're going to uh, eventually, I think, get there. Now, I did mention this last time we talked. You know, I mentioned a bunch of churches. And this is where I think I struggled a little bit with a, the concept of the universal church, the kingdom, and the local church as part of the kingdom. Um, and so I want to look at and, and do a study on this. Let's start in Ephesians chapter 4, would you? If you would, turn over with me, Ephesians 4. In verse 4, where it says, um, I'll, keep, I'll start it at verse 3, because 3 is just a good message. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body and one spirit, just, just as you were called in one, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Now, this, uh, this, these verses in chapter 4, of verse 4, is, I... And here's where I could, I, want, I would like some input from you. Is this talking about the local church? Or is this talking about the universal church? This is, in my mind, it's talking about the universal church. There's one church. There's only one. There's not many. Now, there's a lot of language in the Bible, and this is some of the best when it comes to the mentality of the one church. You know, people like pointing fingers at members of the Church of Christ. Well, you, you folks think you're the only ones going to heaven. No, we, we don't think that. We think, but we do think there's one church, but just because what, that's what the Bible says. And we really want to try to do a good job of being that. 
Whatever that is, that's what we want to be. And we'll go the extra mile to be that. And, and, and don't apologize for that. We don't. But anyway, there's one. There's one church. There's one kingdom. Now, there's a bunch of members, but there's a bunch of churches, a bunch of groups of people even within that. Um, any comments about that? Or maybe, maybe, I'm, wrong, maybe I, I'm off here and you want to help set me straight or um, add to it or, or maybe I've gone a little too far. Well, back up a little bit. Go to Ephesians chapter 1 then. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Glenn, would you mind reading that one? Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. He put all, thing under, uh, all things under his feet to be the head over, um, over all things to the church. And so these are good scriptures, I think, that... Uh, really focus on the, the church universal, the church as in all of us. And maybe because I'm elevated, but it seems warm in here. Is the temperature good or well? I'm going to bring it, I'll bring it down just a tiny notch. All right? All right. And if I need to move it up, just let me know. All right. Well, um, and then there's some more about this church. Um, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where it says, I will build my church. You know, remember when he's talking to Peter, I will build my church. He's not talking about a, there's obviously not a congregation here. He's not talking about a certain place of a certain group of people. It's the church. Um, Acts 8, chapter 3, Paul was ravaging the church. You know, were there individual locations? Yes, but that's, but it was more than one. Uh, Ephesians 1 22 gave him as head over all things to the church Ephesians 5 now as the church submits to Christ Ephesians 5 husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church Colossians 1 and he is head of the body the church these are good examples that we can d try to develop a good relation good understanding of the church collectively the church as a whole the church universal and uh, that there's a lot of scripture that supports it. And then it goes, and then you go back to Ephesians 4, where it talks about oneness and unity and, and that, that there is a church. And our goal as Christians is to be a part of that church, to be a part of whatever this is, to, to play our part in that, that that is our intention. All right. And then... Um, the universal church includes all saints in fellowship with God. The universal church is not a collective work of different churches. And, and I touched on that a while ago. We're not all working together under an umbrella of any one. And I've got some more I want to share on it, but that's an important note. And I, that is a major thing that our world and our society, we, we get, and I mean human race, we get that wrong. So many of us, so many of, the, of humans, of people that call themselves Christians are willing to serve under an umbrella of what they think of as the church, and it doesn't, uh, the, the, the picture of it is not what they're trying to be a part of, at least I don't think so. And again, I think I have a, a slide on that as well. All right. Um, we're going to change gears, and then we'll end up doing a comparison between the local church and the universal church. The local church, the church includes all the saints who worship and work together in a given location. Um, we've talked about this before. The work of the local church, and it, I think just as a member here at Judson Road, it, these things can get out of kilter. Problems can arise and things can happen that will make you question things. And it, I think from time to time, we need to be well grounded in these three. The work of the congregation, the work of Judson Road, revolves around evangelism, edification, 
and benevolence. Have I left anything off? Is there anything else that is the work of Judson Road or any congregation that's out there? Anything. You know, um, uh, I hope you're here Sunday. I hope you can be here Sunday. Uh, we'll, Cody's going to give a presentation from the elders that's going to break down a lot of the work that has gone on in the last year, really two years now, um, here at Judson Road. And, uh, you know, we're, I'm excited about some of that, but it all revolves around these three. And I think from time to time, it, when, there, when there's problems or there's conflict or there's issues, that we might forget about what's the work of the church, what is the role of the church. And then let's, let's break them down and look at them individually. The local church includes saints who worship and work together. Evangelism. Turn with me to Mark chapter 28, excuse me, Matthew 28. Let me get my notes together here too. Matthew 28 and 19. Where it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the, and the, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that the role of Christians is, is and, the, and he's sending out the apostles to do this, but this is a classic example of the Great Commission. And then, of course, the Great Commission again is mentioned over in Mark chapter 16. Um, how about Acts? Would someone read Acts for me? Uh, it's got a good voice. Becky, you got a good voice. Acts 14, verse 7. Um, would someone else grab Romans chapter 10? Uh, Sam, you're way in the back. You got your Bible in front of you? You got your phone, I know. Romans 10, 15. And then we'll, we'll start there and just kind of go down the row. Um, let me get to Acts 14 myself. And verse 7. Go, who was that? Uh, uh, Becca, would you, would you take it? Um, it's talking about Paul and Barnabas. And it says, and they continued to preach the gospel. Okay. Uh, the work of Paul and Barnabas preaching the gospel. Sam, you got Romans 10, verse 15. That's a very good one. 1 Corinthians 1, 17. Uh, where it says, um, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. But the first part of that, not necessarily to baptize, but to preach the gospel. 2 Corinthians 10, 16. If you would, follow along with me. Where it says, um, To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment. And then finally, 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 2, where it says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. And uh, so there's a lot of verses just on the focal point of the work of the church. Here at Judson Road, the we have an evangelism. We, we pay a preacher. We have Jeff O'Rear who comes and stands before us and does an excellent job every Sunday. He'll be here in front of you tonight uh, uh, and every Sunday and Wednesday. And, you know, he does this as a, as a full-time work. But there's also, uh, we support other evangelists. We support a work in Zimbabwe and in the Philippines. I know Cody will have some things to say about that. And that's been, as far as baptisms go, that has been a very good work. Um, we have supported other preachers, uh, and um, 
other works, but the focal point is one of the roles that we feel like here at Judson Road that the church, is, its role is evangelism. We, we got to preach, and we have to see that the, the, the word is preached, and let me say it this way, the, we need to see that the truth is preached, and, uh, and hold each other accountable for the truth. Any other qu- thoughts or other verses or comments about the work of the church, especially as evangelism? One of my favorites that I've really gotten into more recently is edification, the work of edification of the church. Follow along with me, if you would, Matthew 28, verse 20. Twenty-eight and twenty, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, where this is going, I'll, I'll, let's go ahead and look up the verses. Then I'll comment about it. Acts twenty thirty-two, where it says, "So now, brethren, I commend you." To God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. You know, we are to build you up, build to build each other up. Jude chapter 1. Wait. Yeah. In verse 20, where it says, um, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life. And then finally, 1 Thessalonians 5. And verse 11. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. The role of the church is not just in preaching the tr- truth, but it's also in building each other up. And I think we go. I think this goes in cycles. In, in when I and I say this, I'm speaking of us as a collectively as a group here. Sometimes we do a really good job of it. Sometimes time goes by and we neglect this. I think, you know, who, I, who sticks out in my mind that I thought did an excellent job from time to time of doing it was Leonard Tyler. You know, Leonard years ago, every now and then, he'd really get after it, talk, and really brag on whether it was the Bible class teachers or, or something else, but he'd really do a good job of, of praising the people that deserve some praise. Um, and to prove I was watching Sermon Sunday, I thought uh, Jeff did a really good job on the the four T's, and the fourth T Sunday was, you know, thankfulness or thank you. And he, you know, praised our, our teachers. One of the things that I've, I'm really into is our BBS. And, uh, and, and I'll, I just remember years ago thinking, we've got such good teachers. And, uh, you know, we need, to, we need to take advantage of that. But we, we do need to compliment we do need to encourage. I, we have men who've come up here and preached this adult class before that, you know, that was a, it was a tough road for them. You know, it's not easy to do some of the things that some of the people do. And uh, we need to be the Barnabases. As Christians, we need to be Barnabas. We need to be the one that can hold, and, and hold each other up, that we can reinforce each other, that we're uh, glad to see each other. I know one thing that I, I sent out a message, I think it was when, one day when I had announcements, my mom was discouraged. And she was just, you know, she just was struggling. And, of course, she comes the next Sunday, and she gets bombarded by members, you know. How are you, do-? you know, just hugging on her, loving It helped. It was very helpful. We, I think from time to time, we really do a good job of it. But I want to be an encourager to you, you know, that that is one work we have. And, you know, from a, so many of these things, it costs money to pay preachers, to pay evangelists, to do some of the work. This is, 
this doesn't cost, edification is cheap. Edification, the work of the church is not a, an expensive thing for us to do. It doesn't cost us anything to be good encouragers to one another. Um, and to check on, you know, we, 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 we're dealing with the COVID time and so forth, but some of the work that we do during this, this last year and a half has been incredibly important for a lot of people. And there's been probably some that got through the cracks on us too. But, but uh, um, anyway, I, I just wanted to, I wanted to brag on some of us, especially, but really the edification is the work of, of all of us as members. Our work is, involves edification. And then finally, the local church, we are to be benevolent. The work that we do does involve helping other people. And let's look at a couple of verses about that. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. James chapter 1, verse 27 Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep ones unspotted from the world. And then finally, Acts chapter 11. And verse 27, we'll go through 30. Where it says, and in these days... Make sure I got it right. And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now, this is an example of what they did when there was a need. And needs come in various opportunities. And uh, I think this is an area as a local congregation, as a group, that is easy to neglect. But for, sometimes it's someone who knocks on that door. You know, I, I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta tell on Tyler Sams. Uh, Tyler, he, if he met somebody, uh, he would tell them real quick that uh, go see the pastors. You know, he would use the pastor term to go get them to visit with Mike or Glenn or me or somebody else. You know, he was he was really really good that way. And um, and I used to give him a hard time about doing that. Uh, but sometimes it is. You know, we have helped people that just come up and showed up. And then there's been times when we were cautious about it. And had to do some discerning, you know, where we've not helped them very much. And, and I'm going to tell you, I don't like making those calls and those judgments. They're not real fun. Uh, there was one time I committed out in the parking lot to a guy. I wasn't sure he was straight with me. He needed a bus ticket to Houston. I needed some money for a bus ticket to Houston. Okay. I'll tell you what. You get in a truck and I'll haul you the bus stop and I'll buy you a bus ticket to Houston. I thought I'm going to be out about 15 or 8. I was out $30 on that deal. <laughs> I was a little disappointed. But my point was, you know, I, I chose at that time to make it. And y'all, and, and you sitting where you are, I'm sure you've made some of those kind of decisions. Do I help this person? Or do I not? And how? And I'm telling you, that's a hard call to make. And especially when you feel like, I don't know if I wish I should have. I should have helped him. I should have helped her. The, the worst one I've ever seen. This, is, this, was, this was traumatic to me. Kathy and I, are, I, I, if, I bet it was during VBS time because we were up here during the day. Here, and we were in the parking lot. We were about to leave. And uh, this girl comes running across Judson Road. She has no clothes on. and I, I mean, She has clothes, but they're paper. She has paper clothes on. And she's distressed and straught, and, and she comes right, she's running right at me. I don't know what to, you know, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, how are we going to handle this? And, 
And uh, she, she said, she, I just, I've just got out of jail, and i got to get to my boyfriend. Where's your boyfriend, honey? He works at Whataburger. Okay. I was so thankful Kathy was with me, because I don't think I'd have handled it this way, but I let her get in my truck, and I drove her to Whataburger. And let me tell you this, I knew she needed help. There was, no, I, there was no discernment or do I, how do I handle it? Do I help this person? Every now and then you come across one, there's no doubt. you got to help them. This was the lady that needed help. She, uh, she had such little clothes on. I take her to Whataburger. She goes inside. She comes right back out and she says, this is his car. I'm going to stay here in the car. So it was over by Walmart. So I went and got a, I didn't know what else to do. I got a Walmart card and put a little money on it and gave it to her. I said, baby, go in there and get you some clothes. And it was, it was a sad deal. And I know in education, some of us have been teachers, and, and Kathy's wanted to adopt about five kids that she has come across, you know. And, we, and if you've been here long enough, you know we did try to take on one of them at one time. But you see kids that they don't have so much, and you really, the, you know, it hurts your heart. From time to time, you come across the ones you've got to help. You have to. And there comes a time, from time to time, you have to be discerning. Am I really going to help this person? Could, could some other organization do what this person actually needs? Yes, ma'am? I appreciate the discernment, but all of that is on an individual basis. Excellent. Make you make a good point. I just was intended to use some examples right. that have hit us. They do come through this door right here. Right, but you, don't, you didn't do it out of the person. Absolutely. You're exactly right. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Let me talk about that a little more. Let me expand on that because you're exactly right, Beck. And if you couldn't hear, she said these are things. These examples I've given, they're traumatic and they're intense and they're stressful. But they were the work of Tracy Blankenship. They were not the work of Judson Row. Let's talk about that a little bit because. A lot of people confuse that. The religious world get, gets it wrong here, too. The religious world thinks, hey, if it's a good cause, let's write a check out of the church treasury and go help them people. And then people really need help. And their argument as far as the need can be valid. But it can be wrong for the church to, to help those needs. He, in this last one in Acts chapter 11, they help the needy saints. Because one, one card I have played before is I have told someone we help our own. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we're good at helping our own. And uh, you might can find an individual that might help you. But, uh, you know, if, and there has been times that I've been aware that we've used money out of the church treasury to help members of Judson Road. That so-and-so car wreck or so-and-so with health issues and so forth. That is the work of our congregation. I, that's a difficult work. That's not easy. It's not cheap. And, he, and decisions sometimes do have to be made. But Becca makes a great point as far as the, there is a difference between what Tracy Blankenship can do and what Glenn Collier can do and what you can do and what we can do collectively. There is a huge difference. And I wanted to use... My only ex my experience is to point out the fact that it's difficult to make some of those decisions. Is this, does, you know, even as elders, is this the work we need to be spending money on? And how much? How much is enough? Who and where, where when or where where does it end financially and so forth? Those are tough decisions. This is not. Benevolence is not, uh, is not an easy work of the church, and I think it has to be something we're careful with. It is, uh, and there are countless opportunities. Probably the most engaging work we have done has probably been the work in Zimbabwe or the Philippines as far as consistently, and then there's the work of the, you know, that matters, and then there's the privacy issues of some of our own congregation and so forth. You know, this is a... This is a important issue that the church has. But I would be remiss. I would not be doing my, uh, this a very good service if I didn't point out what you and I can do and what we can do collectively from the church treasury. 
but the church work is does have benevolent responsibilities, and uh, uh, and especially to saints. To you know, we um, remember the hurricane hit, and there was a, that congregation in Beaumont or wherever it was, and you know, we sent some relief there to some of those saints there. Um, and this becomes also a big issue when we start talking about the churches working together. There's another landmine that we can step in and, and really mess it up. Um, anyway, I want to emphasize those three tonight. Um, the, the preaching and uh, edification and benevolence. Those are the three I want to make a big deal about and do it correct for this audience. Hopefully I didn't muddy the water too much. Any other comments about those three, the work of the church? I think where we'll probably pick up tomorrow, I mean uh, next week, the uh, elders and deacons and the, uh, the role they play in the church and, uh, uh, and the fact that the church is limited to the local work that it's done now, uh, I want to make sure I got that right because we can, we can send money to places way away from here, but, uh, but the work of the local church. Oh, when I say the local work, the local congregation, and uh, the, we don't use sponsor. I want to get into the sponsoring church stuff and how that's been a catastrophe and caused major divisions, especially in the, before my time, the 50s, 60s era. That was a bigger deal, I think, than it pro maybe now. But it's still there, and uh, so I want to I want to get into that a little bit. We'll do that next week, and then probably get into the premillennial stuff. Any other final comments of uh, the work of the church locally, or or even the role of the you know, the church universal or the role we play in it, Glenn? Well, just you know, benevolence and what you're talking about. We could go and search out and spend all of our time. Yes, I got but you. Our primary goal is to teach the gospel, and that is part of it that we come across people and we need to give benevolence, but um, sometimes there's that balance there. I mean, that's... that's there's an endless supply of people that oh, need yeah. help. Yeah, and, and neglect the work of evangelism. That's right. And that's, uh, that's not easy, D differentiating and wading through some of those decisions is not real easy sometimes. Good point. All right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind it up there rather than get into the deacons and the elders and, and uh, that part of the church.